were, I mean, the, the, the last crisis was brought about by excessive lending and stupid lending and giving loans to people that should never have been giving loans and building properties just for the sake of building properties where there was no demand for them. So there was a huge amount of excess building, excess lending, and that wasn't the case now. The population has always been growing faster than the amount of inventory in the US. Lending standards have been quite you know, relatively strict for the last seven or eight years. You, you have to qualify for a loan in 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19. You can get a good rate, but you still have to qualify. You still have to have some money and evidence of, of income. Um, so you know, I think people were a lot more careful. There's a ton more equity now in the system than there was in 2008. I mean, property prices would literally have to fall by half in order for most people to be underwater nowadays. So there's, you know, this pandemic is a totally different animal to the credit default swap fiasco and all the rest of it. It's very, very different. But on the other hand, we've had a 10 year boom and it has to stop eventually. There has to be an adjustment. It's not, most of the time it's not like a roadrunner falling off a cliff adjustment like it was in 2008. It's often just like a little ebbs and flows. And we'd lots of those, they come every usually eight or nine years. So we're definitely, we were definitely due another one and the pandemic definitely kind of accelerated it. But just as the pandemic was accelerating it, then you have the government coming in and just throwing trillions of dollars at the system, which again, stops that roadrunner moment. And so I, I just don't know, John, it's, it's just too hard to say. Uh, I think you're definitely overdue. We're overdue an adjustment for real estate prices. You can't just keep increasing every year for 10 years and then, you know, do another 10 years after that. I don't think so. Um, this is a very different type of crisis. I wasn't seeing the same kind of silliness in the last five years. I was seeing a lot of people just building real estate portfolios, just working hard, saving money, some people were getting creative using credit cards to do birth strategies or whatever. And that's, that's their own individual risk. There's nothing systemic about that. They're just risking their own bankruptcies. But, and a lot of the time you can get away with it in a good market with, with a good plan. So I think there's a reckoning coming, but it still might be a couple of years away. I mean, this, this could go on, this kind of limbo, we're in this kind of gap between the lockdown and, and the, the vaccine, this gap could last a long time and, and real estate prices might not fall much at all until, until afterwards. Yeah, it's interesting enough. to hear you talk about the equity side because one of the things we've been looking at is the number of single family homes that have gone into forbearance since this all started. And mm -hmm. I believe actually that program ran out yesterday, which was the 31st of August. I don't know if it got extended, um, but it was quite a large amount. I think, John, what was it? It was up of like a third or something yeah, like that or something fairly high. Amount. By the way, Wells Fargo is being sued by borrowers because they're saying that they were not informed that their loans were in forbearance when they stopped making payments on them. <laughs> it's, it's comical. But yeah, there was like a third of uh, homeowners that- Why would you, you know, stop making payments? They were in forbearance basically, but they're saying that they were not basically because of the pandemic, what these borrowers assumed, and it was in the real deal. I believe it was a real deal. The borrowers are basically saying that, you know, there was a pandemic. We didn't know that we, we had the money, but we would have made the payments. We didn't realize that we'd have a forbearance on our record. We thought that we just didn't have to pay and we could make it up. So they're actually suing Wells Fargo because they're saying Wells Fargo did not report to them accurately that they would go into forbearance for not paying their mortgage. They thought that they were just waived and they would be able to pay it in the future. So I read that this morning. I thought that's it was funny. funny. So they thought they could request forbearance, but, but not have forbearance beside their name after requesting it. Exactly. Cause that was, that was a big thing when this all happened, you know, mm -hmm. listen, if you need it, you have to take it. But if you didn't need it, you know, there was a good school of thought. I'm just not going to pay. It happened to some of our tenants who didn't want to pay rent, but it, it, it does negatively impact you. I mean, you do get a little bit of a black eye when you have to report to your next bank or your next lender or whatever. Yeah, I, I had a forbearance. Yeah, it's, it's in the pandemic. And maybe it's overlooked in six months, 12 months, 10 years, whatever it is. But, yeah. you know, they were pissed that they, you know, they were not properly informed or like I said, it was, you know, I, you know, who knows? It's just borrowers pissed about everything. So it happens. But uh, it was fun. It was comical because I, I don't, I don't know if it was, I think it's state by state at this point. Some states have a little bit more flexibility with homeowners and tenants and others don't. And, you know, some, some are already giving those, 
benefits for unemployment and stuff like that. So I think it's going to vary a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And look, there's a big difference between the forbearance side of things and the eviction because for, like I said, there's so much equity in most of the single family homes around the country that if they ever need to sell that house, even though they skipped six or 12 months of payments, that's just going to get deducted from the sales price. Correct. And they're still going to have some equity left over and it'll get paid one way or the other, unless it, unless something very unusual happened, then there's a big price drop. The eviction is a whole other thing where you have these landlords that haven't received rent for three, four, five, six months. You know, I know from experience, if a tenant hasn't paid rent for two months, your chances of getting it back are like less than 5%. You're not getting it back. And so if they can't pay up that six months rent or four months rent or five months rent, they're going to have to get evicted eventually. And obviously that stuff keeps getting extended with, with, with limitations, the governor, Governor DeSantis in Florida just extended it another month, you know, until October 1st, last night, you know, he's been doing it since April 1st. So, you know, the evictions are going to be problematic, I think, much more so than the, the forbearance. 100%. And, uh, but again, well, how's that going to affect things? They're, they're not the property owners, but I don't know how much landlords are suffering. I mean, I'm personally okay. My, my tenants have been, have been paying. I'm, I'm good. But clearly there's, you know, millions of other landlords that, that aren't good you know, in the residential yep. side, I'm not even talking about commercial. Yeah. Well, I think that that's where I was going before we dovetailed was that, you know, we were talking like, Hey, there's going to be these tons of foreclosures. I mean, you know, probably a third of people didn't have to take forbearance, mm-hmm. but you know, that means some people did. And if people can't pay 10% unemployment, there's going to be foreclosures, but then started hearing about, you know, more equity than ever before in homes. And like you said, it has a cushion, which, allows you to sell for less because you're not borrowing at this crazy high rate. Although the slew of recent refinances that have happened may change that because rates are crazy low and, you know, home prices are going crazy. I mean, here it's ridiculous. I was just talking to my cousins who are agents and it's like, they're getting offers like $30,000 over asking with like nothing. It's crazy. I mean, there's no inventory, so it's supply and demand, but it is interesting to see how that's going to be affected. And you see back and forth of like, you know, is the equity going to protect people or is there just going to be a slew of foreclosures that is going to affect the market and the residential market once things start opening back up and once all this money disappears from COVID. And I'm curious how you guys are looking at this in the next, you know, from today inside the next 12 months of, is this going to be another opportunity to pick up condos for, you know, $75,000 or is this going to be, you know, know, kind of just steady along and just kind of muddle along for the next couple of years where you're really not sure? I mean, you have to figure that, I don't know how long it's going to take, but you have to figure that eventually the banks are going to control a ton of real estate again, just as Mm -hmm. they did 10 years ago. And it took them years to get through all those REOs and all those foreclosures. It wasn't a quick process, especially in judicial states like Florida, you know, the foreclosures move slowly. So, but I think eventually the, the, you know, there will be a, I mean, just with, I mean, the four parents might not cause a spike in foreclosures because of the equity, but the unemployment will cause a spike in foreclosures. That's the biggest predictor of mortgage defaults is unemployment. Mm -hmm. So that, that will cause a spike in foreclosures. And eventually then banks are obviously going to get all those judgments and they're going to control all that inventory. And there's going to be a, a spike in, in Oreos and there's going to be a spike in foreclosures, but it, it could take a while. I mean, I used to buy at least five houses a month in foreclosure auctions in Tampa. And, you know, they've been mostly shut for the last five months. I managed to actually buy one last Thursday, which was unusual because it was a, it was a, it was an uncontested uh, foreclosure. The defendant didn't contest it and and it was, it was vacated two days after the foreclosure. So I kind of got lucky with that one, but the majority of them, if you've any kind of, competent attorney at all you just get them cancelled and cancelled and cancelled as long as you want so you know it could, it could take a while Chris it could I don't know how long they're going to at the minute it looks like they're going to keep extending these moratoriums until after the election so maybe next year you're going to start seeing a spike uh, but again there's a limit to how much every county can physically process so and the banks aren't going to just dump them on the market either because they're not they're not suffering the way they were. They're not suffering the equity losses. They're not suffering the liquidity problems that they were 10 years ago either. They're far better capitalized. So I think they'll just kind of be dribbling them out at, at a rate that demand kind of picks up. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it could be a while before we get deals, but at least we'll see a surge in inventory because at the minute inventory is so tight, like you're saying, your friends are anything listed immediately gets full price over full price offers, waiving all sorts of contingencies. And I'm, I'm seeing that in Tampa, you know, in, in my little buy box, we're at about a month's inventory, whereas even a busy market should be at least three months inventory. It's just mm-hmm. ridiculously tight and, and people are willingly overpaying for, for, for real estate that they know is, is not worth it. They're, whether it's renovated or unrenovated, it's just trying to get something to rent out or something to live in. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So I want to come back a little bit and um, go back to your story a little bit because I think it's interesting. Mm-hmm. When you started overseas, because I think it's somewhat relatable to a lot of people that do it out of state, just farther distance, maybe some water in between. Um, when and why did you decide to move to Florida? Was it a business decision, a personal decision? What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was very much a business decision because my, my wife is, is Spanish and we got married in Spain, raised two kids in Spain. And, you know, this is, I got married in 2008 and kids in 2010 and 12. And I kind of started doing real estate in Florida full time around 2010. But I didn't want to leave didn't want to leave Spain. I've always been conscious of the benefits of a location independent uh, income stream. And even though I knew back in those early 2010s, if I moved to Florida, I could earn more money. I was also aware that Madrid's a pretty nice place to live. It's not like, you know, a lot of people might be living in in poor countries in Central and South America and and the US is this kind of shining light and this higher quality of life. I already had a pretty good (laughs) quality of life in Spain. It's a nice place, you know, nice weather, nice food, nice people, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I I had business partners here and and that was, you know, the main reason I was able to run a successful business with, with business partners. So, you know, clearly I was buying properties at auction from Madrid, you know, which I couldn't have done in the nineties, obviously, because they weren't Mm -hmm. online and I wasn't able to look up all the public record stuff that I was now, but you know, you need people to drive by them. You need people to, to get in there. You need people to renovate them and inspect them. So you have to have local people to do all that stuff. And um, if you have, then I've no qualms about investing out of state or overseas. I own rentals out of state now. And, you know, still overseas people are buying here. But it's it's not, you have to plan it out. You have to map it out. You need a business plan. You need systems in place. You, you can't just accept any kind of crap email that comes through your inbox. You had to have a, make a plan. Obviously I had to travel over here quite a lot to decide which neighborhoods we wanted to go deep in because that's how we ultimately became successful was going literally an inch wide and, and a mile deep 